it, it's, it's incredibly complex. I mean, you really read Genesis, it's genetic engineering, and if you read Ezekiel, it's like reading science fiction, folks. Alex Jones, like many other popular conspiracy theorists and ancient alien theorists, insert eyes of Jesus into the Holy Bible without doing any exit Jesus. Ancient alien theorists like David Icke say the serpent in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve was a reptilian alien and that Genesis was a symbolic story, not a literal historical event, all in an attempt to discredit the historical Christian religion. According to ancient alien theorists, extraterrestrials with superior knowledge of science and engineering landed on planet Earth thousands of years ago, sharing their expertise with early ancient civilizations and forever changing the course of human history. But how did this concept develop and is there any evidence to support it? Ancient alien theory grew out of the centuries-old idea that life exists on other planets in the universe and that humans and extraterrestrials have crossed paths before. The theme of human-alien interaction was thrust into the spotlight in the 1960s driven by a wave of UFO sightings in popular films like 2001 A Space Odyssey. The space program played no small part in this as well. If mankind could travel to other planets, why couldn't extraterrestrials visit planet Earth? In 1968, the Swiss author Eric von Dyneiken published Chariots of the Gods, which became an immediate best-selling book. In it, Eric von Dyneiken put forth his ancient alien hypothesis that thousands of years ago, alien space travelers from other planets visited the planet Earth where they taught human civilization about technology and influenced ancient religions. Eric von Dyneiken is regarded by many as the father of ancient alien theory, also known as the ancient astronaut theory. Most ancient alien theorists, including Eric von Dyneiken, point to two types of evidence to support their worldview. The first is ancient religious texts in which humans witness and interact with gods or other heavenly beings who descended from the sky, sometimes in vehicles resembling spaceships. The second is physical specimens such as artwork depicting alien-like figures and ancient archaeological marvels like stone hens and the pyramids of Egypt. Many ancient alien theorists and Christians like to point to Genesis 6 in the book of Genesis to imply extraterrestrials, fallen angels, demons, which most of this is due to the fact most people eyes as Jesus into a historical text. Here's one definition of eyes as Jesus. A subjective method of interpretation by introducing one's own opinions into the original biblical text opposed to exit Jesus. Here's another definition of eyes as Jesus. An interpretation especially of Holy Scripture that reflects the personal ideas or viewpoint of the interpreter reading something into a text that isn't there. Most Christians who proclaim to be theistic evolutionists or progressive creationists or day-age creationists or old earth creationists, including ancient alien theorists, use the method of eyes of Jesus in their interpretation of Holy Scripture. For example, in the book of Genesis, in the six-day creation narrative, the Hebrew word for day is yom. Yom in the ancient world meant day, and yom was a noun. A day meant a literal 24-7 hour day in the ancient world, not a billion years. That's reading into the text of the ancient Holy Scripture. Are the Nephilim and the sons of God in Genesis 6 really aliens or giants? Let's look at the passage in question in context. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men 
who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 1, 5. The passage describes the Nephilim as being men twice using two different Hebrew words. It does not use the Hebrew words used to describe angels. It's pretty obvious from the context that God was not happy about what was going on between the sons of God, the Nephilim, and the daughters of men. Let's go on to examine how other biblical passages use these terms. Unfortunately, the phrase sons of God appears in only five verses from only two books of the Old Testament. Two verses are found in the Genesis 6 flood account. The other three verses are found in the book of Job. From the book of Job, the context clearly indicates that sons of God are angelic beings since they enter directly into God's presence or existed before the creation of the planet Earth. In the New Testament, sons of God always refer to redeemed human beings. Some Christians have speculated that the sons of God from Genesis 6 were demonic beings who had sexual relations with human women and are now condemned to future judgment. However, the Lord Jesus of Nazareth made it clear that angels are asexual beings who do not engage in sexual relations at all, since demons are merely fallen angels, would likewise be unable to procreate with women. Some apocryphal holy books, such as the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, indicate that the Nephilim were fallen angels. However, since these apocryphal holy books make some outrageous claims saying that the giants were over 450 feet tall, since the Holy Bible indicates that angels are asexual beings, it makes sense that they could not be the sons of God who produced children with the daughters of men. The best interpretation is that the sons of God were men who were descended from Seth, who followed the Lord for a time, in contrast to the bloodline of Cain, which produced the daughters of men, however, Right before the global flood, even the sons of God took wives among the bloodline of Cain and therefore became corrupted themselves through their unbelieving wives. This is one of the reasons why the Lord God determined to destroy the entire human civilization except for the eight people who still followed the Lord God like Noah and his extended family. Genesis 6 also describes the Nephilim who were the corrupt strongmen of their time, notorious for their violent exploits. Genesis 6, 4, these men were probably also descendants of Cain, who were terrorizing the peoples and represented at least part of the group whose thoughts were only evil continually. The Nephilim that were described after the global flood were also evil strongmen, but not related to those pre-flood people since they were all destroyed in the global flood. In the Hebrew Holy Bible, the Old Testament, Cain and Abel are the two sons of Adam and Eve. The Quran mentions the story of Cain and Abel, calling them the two sons of Adam. In the Greek New Testament, Cain is referred to as from the evil one, while others have of the evil one. Some interpreters take this to mean that Cain was literally the son of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, a parallel idea can be found in Jewish tradition that the serpent from the Garden of Eden was the father to the firstborn Cain. In all versions, Cain is a crop farmer and his younger brother Abel is a shepherd. Cain is portrayed as sinful, committing the first murder by killing his brother Abel after the Lord God has rejected his offerings of produce but accepted the animal sacrifices brought by Abel. Abel, the brother of Cain, is sometimes seen as the first murder victim and the first martyr in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The English word hell comes from Germanic mythology. According to Professor Stephen L. Harris, Sheol is a place of nothingness that has its roots in the Hebrew Bible. The ancient Hebrews had no idea of an immortal soul living a full and vital life beyond death, nor of any resurrection or return from death. Human beings like the beast of the field are made of dust of the earth, and at death they return to the dust. Genesis 2-7 from the New International Version of the Bible. Then the Lord God formed a man 
from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. The Hebrew word nefesh traditionally translated living soul but more properly understood as living creature is the same word used for all breathing creatures and refers to nothing immortal. All the dead go to Sheol and there they lie and sleep together whether good or evil, rich or poor, slave or free. Stephen L. Harris shares similar remarks in his book, Understanding the Bible. The concept of eternal punishment does not occur in the Hebrew Bible, which uses the term Sheol to designate a bleak subterranean region where the dead, good and bad alike, subsists only as impotent shadows. In the Hebrew Bible, the dead in Sheol were called Raphim, and conceptualized as empty shadows or ghosts who could, according to Isaiah 29:4, only communicate in hushed squeaks. The only way to contact them was through necromancy as seen in 1 Samuel 28:8-19, where the wits of Ender summons the ghost of the deceased prophet Samuel at the behest of King Saul. I exit Jesus everything in the Holy Bible. That's why I'm a biblical exit. Truth is truth regardless of your opinion. Please learn how to exit Jesus everything in the Bible and not just what fits your agenda. Cause I have no agenda.